Yeah. Okay, I think, hello, <laughs> I think we can begin, good morning all, uh, I don't know what kind of a message you can expect this morning, but they gave me some hot sauce up here, so. <laughs> Um, we welcome all of you uh, in the name of our Lord, and uh, I'll remind my heart, I'll remind you again, as you come to study the Word of God, there are many things that'll help you along the way, but there's no substitute for the indispensable principle. And the indispensable principle is total reliance upon God's Holy Spirit. It is God's book. He inspired it, and now he needs to illumine it. Only the Holy Spirit can take these precious written words and unveil the living word, our Lord Jesus. We study, we're in Corinthians, but we're not studying Corinthians to know Corinthians. We're studying Corinthians to know our Lord Jesus Christ in a more infinite way. <laughs> Before we go to prayer, I want to share a verse from Psalm 68, verse 9. Psalm 68, 9. Thou didst shed abroad plentiful rain, O God. Thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was parched. And God refreshes his inheritance. And if you're not familiar with his inheritance, look in the mirror. <laughs> because you are his inheritance. And if in any way, at any time, you're parched, the Lord will refresh us. So I don't know if anyone's parched today, but that verse is very precious. Let's just look to the Lord and ask him to confirm his inheritance. And if anyone is parched, that he would refresh us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have this precious opportunity to meet in this place freely and to trust the indwelling Holy Spirit to turn our hearts and our eyes again afresh to our Lord Jesus Christ. We commit our session unto you and our meditation. I pray that you would watch over and protect your people from anything I might say that's flesh and blood. And we just pray that you might speak because it's your speaking that will not return void. We know we don't deserve any of this, but our Lord Jesus deserves it. And we claim it in his all prevailing name. Amen. Amen. All right, welcome again to our little look at our Lord Jesus in the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we're in lesson 26, and you might think, oh, I'm lost. I need a review of 25 lessons. <laughs> that would be true if all we did were topics. But since we're looking at a person, the Lord Jesus, you can come in any time and leave any time and expect a blessing from the Lord. So each lesson stands on its own, and although it is connected, and it helps to have the background, but uh, don't feel lost because it's lesson number 26. Uh, for the past two sessions, we have been looking at uh, all the way through 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is God's complete model of the New Covenant experience. And so we look at the Apostle Paul to see what our life would look like if indeed Christ is our very life. And we've looked so far at 14 or 15 or 16 principles. I forgot which one we're on. But we're on the principle titled Redemptive Suffering. This is our third lesson on redemptive suffering. It's a very important topic because as you look at Paul, you see how Paul deals with suffering in a redemptive way. 
Uh, if you miss those first two sessions, see Sweet Lily and uh, get cassette 24, 25, and you'll be caught up. Uh, anyway, as the book of 2 Corinthians uses the expression, uses or, or explains that topic, redemptive suffering, redemptive suffering is the life of Jesus lived in us and he's pouring out his life through us especially as we go through trials and sufferings in life and he's pouring himself through us in order to bring redemption to the world that's why we call it redemptive suffering uh, follow along please on the notes or you can use any a mechanical device or if you have a Bible turn to 2nd Corinthians 4 uh, this sort of summarizes redemptive suffering we are afflicted in every way but not cross perplexed but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken struck down but not destroyed always carrying about in the body and I once again call attention to this, the dying of Jesus, not the dying of self. It's the dying of Jesus that we carry about so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. We who live are constantly delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us, but life in you. Now especially verse 10, uh, this is the redemptive suffering experience in a nutshell. Always carrying about in our bodies the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest. In other words, 100% of everything that takes place in the life of a new covenant Christian that we would call suffering, 100% of that is designed to manifest Christ to others. It's all about him releasing his life. And that's why we call New Covenant suffering, grace suffering, uh, the suffering of those who are looking to Jesus, we call that missionary suffering, soul winning suffering, it's evangelism, it's missions, whatever it is at whatever degree, any tragedy that comes in to the life of one trusting Jesus is a missionary tragedy. Any accident that comes into the life of a New Covenant Christian is a missionary accident. Any sickness that comes into the life of a New Covenant Christian is an evangelistic sickness, a soul-winning sickness. Any kind of setback, any kind of persecution, any kind of weakness, any trial, uh, the responsibilities of life, taking care of the elderly and so on. Uh, all of the suffering and uh, hindrance that comes with old age, all of it, every bit of it is redemption, redemptive. Every hardship in the life of a new covenant believer is redemptive. And everything is about carrying the dying of Jesus. When he lived on earth, he had a body. It was an incarnate body. He lived in the flesh. And in that body, he went to the cross. It's the same Jesus, but it's a different body now. He doesn't live in his incarnate body now on earth. He lives in heaven, of course, but on earth he doesn't. On earth, he lives in his mystical body, the church, you. In his incarnate body, he went to the cross. Don't be surprised if in his new body, he's going to the cross. He always goes to the cross in the Christian. It's all about him 
pouring out his life, him self-denying, him self-sacrificing, him pouring out. You're carrying in your life the dying of Jesus so that his life can be made manifest to others. And so a new covenant life is Jesus living redemptively. You don't get that by study or by thinking or by speculating or by trying to imitate the Lord Jesus. That's a revelation of God and it's made when the life of Christ, the indwelling life of Christ is real and it begins to pour out. That's God's way. That's the best hope the world has is watching the Christian in redemptive suffering. So he wants to radiate, he wants to shine. Now when we left off, we were discussing chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. We're afflicted in every way, not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our body. Let me just home in again on those four principles. Afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Crushed has to do with weight. You get crushed when there's a weight. And the whole idea is we're afflicted, but all the weights that come into our life, we learn from Isaiah's prophecy of the little baby Jesus. The government shall be on his shoulders. He never expects you to carry the weight. He never expects me to carry the weight. It's on his shoulders. Whether the burden is family or children or finances or some heavy responsibility or the weight of providing or the weight of guiding or especially the heaviest weight I've ever found in my life is the weight of living a holy life before God. I'll tell you, that'll crush you if you try to bear that on your own. And so we've got to look to the Lord. Uh, God actually adds, I've shared this before, He adds to the burden to lighten your load. And you say, how does that work? He adds to the burden to lighten the load because after a while you're going to wise up and crawl out from under it. If it gets heavy enough, you're not going to keep trying to bear it. And so in his grace, he keeps adding to the burden to lighten the load. And the load is lightened. My burden is light, said our Lord Jesus, when we give it to him. We don't bear it on our own. And that connection I love Psalm 55, 22. And I love it especially in the New American Standard because there's a footnote. Uh, I remember it because it's 55 and then turn that over, 22. <laughs> Stupid association, <laughs> but that's how I remember it. Uh, Isaiah 50, I mean Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He'll never allow the righteous to be shaken. In my New American Standard in the margin, it has the literal Hebrew. And it doesn't say, cast your burden on the Lord. It says, what he has given you, cast on him. So he gives you the burden so that you can cast it on him. He gives me the burden so that I can cast it on him so that he can bear it. Uh, the Lord gives you that burden because others are watching you. It's redemptive. They're watching you. Uh, I could spend the rest of this lesson and then some describing what Paul meant when he said, afflicted in every way. There's no end to that list. Afflicted in every way. Uh, it could be some change in your life. I know some people that uh, have really had a crisis because they faced retirement. And that became a tremendous burden uh, because they didn't want to retire and they were forced to retire and all that kind of thing. 
uh, a season of unemployment, any financial hardship, any unexpected thing that comes into our life, old age, sickness, a broken family, a wayward family, and especially a fall into temptation and sin. Uh, all of these things we try to bear, and if we try to bear them, the life of Christ is clogged. The life of Christ is not manifest. Uh, I love Isaiah 64, 3 and 4. Uh, look in vain on your sheet. This one's not on your sheet. Sorry about that. Uh, but he, uh, Isaiah 6, uh, 46, 3 and 4 says, Listen to me. You have been born by me from your birth. You have been carried from the womb. God's been carrying you all your life long. And then he says, even to your old age, I will be the same. Even to your graying years, I will bear you. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. <laughs> what a promise that is. Yea and amen. That he not only wants to carry your burden, he wants to carry you. And that's what he does. And so, that's what Paul said. That's redemptive. When you go through affliction, and you're not crushed. You're not trying to carry it yourself. We're afflicted, but not crushed. Uh, if we're crushed, the life doesn't flow. And they don't see Christ. Uh, same thing in verse 8. Uh, afflicted in every way, not crushed. Perplexed but not despairing. It's okay to be perplexed. You know what perplexed is? You don't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. Things are taking place in your life. He's like, what's God up to? What's he doing? Why is he allowing this? Especially at this time. We are perplexed, but not despairing. If we get to despairing, if we get to hopelessness, all the steps along the road to that. First, we, we don't know what's going on, so we begin to doubt. Is the Lord t paying attention? Does he love me? And then we get frustrated, and then we get anxious, and then we get depressed, and then we despair and give up hope. Every step along the way, every step, doubt, frustration, anxiety, depression, all of that, every step dims the light more and more. The lens gets foggier and foggier. They can't see Christ. And so be perplexed. You don't have to know what's going on. I don't have a clue. In fact, you won't know what's going on. Uh, I told you last time, you don't know one-tenth of what percent of uh, one percent of what's happening in your life because God is always working and it's always mysterious. Somebody with a blue Toyota Tundra left their lights on. Does somebody back here have a Toyota Tundra? No? Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> uh, anyway, uh, the whole idea is that it's redemptive, so we don't despair. Uh, when a Christian becomes hopeless, the light goes out completely. Verse 9, persecuted but not forsaken. The same thing. God will allow in your life opposition. He lets your reputation uh, get ruined. He has people say bad things about you and misrepresent you. Uh, people will walk all over you and will try to retaliate. And uh, so many things. They will uh, persecute us. And someday, and in some places already, maybe here, uh, the ultimate is they're going to lop your head off. And all redemptively for the name of our Lord Jesus. Uh, if you begin to doubt God's presence, that's forsaken. Does he love me? Why is he allowing this? Doesn't he see what's going on? Doesn't he know I have young children? What's happening? You can be perplexed. But don't ever doubt that the Lord is with you. Because as you move toward that, the light is dim. 
All of this is designed to release his life and to let him shine forth. Uh, struck down but not destroyed, verse 9, last part. I'm destroyed when I give up. The idea is we're often knocked down, and many things knock us down. God will allow you to fail. God will allow you to fall. But the righteous man rises seven times. Seven's the perfect number. You never stop rising. It's in the rising that his life is manifest. It's in the resurrection that his life is manifest. If you stay down, if you're destroyed, then the light goes out. And so all of these things, I'm just trying to illustrate, uh, is, are redemptive. Uh, but a crushed heart bearing its own burden, someone who is despairing and giving up hope, someone who feels forsaken, God doesn't love me anymore, someone who's destroyed and thrown in the towel, has stopped the flow of the life of the Lord Jesus. We are to carry the life of Christ, uh, the, the, the dying of Christ, so that the life of Christ might be manifest. It's in the afflictions, it's in the perplexities, it's in the persecution, it's in the striking down that Jesus is seen. And I, unless I apply his life to my suffering, there will be no redemptive value. So that's what we looked at. Now, before I leave this important purpose of redemptive suffering, I know I spent all last time on that, but it's so basic. Why does God allow this in my life? And to show that it's always redemptive, it's always missionary, it's always for somebody else. What's going on in your life right now? Whatever aches and pains and, and uh, limitations, whatever's going on in your life, it's not primarily for you. It's for somebody else. And that's one of the amazing unveilings that we have in Second Corinthians. What I want to do is take that same truth. That's correct, Bill. <laughs> I want to take that same truth and I want to illustrate it twice. Once in the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament because it's the New Testament. Yes. It's the New Testament in story form. It's the New Testament in seed form. It's the New Testament in the bud. It's the same truth, but it begins once upon a time. And you follow the redemptive history, and there's a story that carries the principle. The New Testament's fully developed its doctrine. Sometimes that's harder to, to lay hold of. It's a lot easier to see a high tower that I can run to and be safe than to see that I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. It's the same thing, but sometimes the theology of it just is, is very, very heavy and you can't get into it. So I want to give an Old Testament illustration, which I call the seed. The Gospels, still not fully developed, which I call the bud, and then the epistles, which are the fully developed. That's where God explains everything. So I want to give you a picture from the seed and a picture from the bud. Same truth. All suffering is redemptive. That's what we're illustrating. Uh, now, I, I think I need to say this. Not, I don't know all of you here, but those here and those that follow by tape and so on, not everyone has had the same opportunity to learn Bible stories. And I'm about to say, I'm going to share a familiar Bible story. And someone might say, that's not familiar to me. We don't all have the same opportunity. Uh, I was 16 years old before I knew Jesus walked on water. I never heard about the, the lion's den. I never heard about the three men in the furnace. You know who told me that? Lillian. My, my girlfriend. We would go on walks and she would teach me the Bible. That's how I got to know the Bible stories. And so I don't want to take for granted that just because it's a familiar story to some that it's familiar to all. 
Uh, and it's sort of a long story, but I think it's familiar to most, and I want to take the time uh, to develop it. <clears throat> and I'm talking about the three men in the fiery furnace. That's the story that illustrates this redemptive suffering. Uh, now, there are so many ways you can look at it. You can look at that and study faith. Because there's a lot of faith in that story. Or you could look at it, since it's a furnace, and study the trials of life. There's a lot about that. You can study total surrender, because those guys really surrendered to the Lord. You can study God's sustaining grace. There's so many ways to look at that story. But I am convinced that the main point of that story is exactly what 2 Corinthians is talking about, redemptive suffering. So what I'd like to do is follow along, have you follow along, and we're going to read. It's rather lengthy, but I think it's important. I've isolated the verses that carry the story. It begins Daniel 3.1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits. That Dear friends in Christ, is 90 feet high. That's how big it was. And 60 cubits with, it's with six cubits. And he set it on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And it was all made of gold because in another image he was the head of gold. It's all about Nebuchadnezzar. And he makes this big image to worship him. Verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, O people, nation, men of every language. At the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of of a burning fire. Then the report reached the king that there were three Hebrews that didn't bow down. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, Lillian gets angry when I say Abednego. So, <laughs> Abednego, <laughs> these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not observe your gods or worship your golden image, which you have set up. Well, you can expect he wasn't happy. Chapter 313. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then these men were brought before King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Now, if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Daniel 3, 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. 19. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. 
And he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes. And they were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the commands was so urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of fly, <laughs> the flame of fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste, and he said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, come out you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered round and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. <clears throat> well, there's more, but those are the facts that carry the story and the principle I want to share. Now, this is an illustration of persecuted but not forsaken in the extreme. The Lord allowed this great trial in the lives of these three Hebrew men. <clears throat> this is really the essence of what we call full surrender. Now remember, uh, full surrender is not willingness to do. That's what a lot of Christians think. I'm surrendered. I'll go anywhere he wants me to go. I'll do anything he wants me to do. I'll be anything he wants me to be. I'll live anywhere he wants me to live. Uh, willingness to do. That's not the heart of full surrender. The heart of full surrender is not giving up this or that or doing this or that. Full surrender is not willingness to do, it's willingness to be done unto. That's not the same thing. And that is the heart of surrender. I'm willing to be done unto without retaliation. And that's when his life is manifest. This passage is not understood unless you see the missionary heart of God. God was reaching out to the sinner, Nebuchadnezzar. It's amazing, but God loved Nebuchadnezzar. He was a terrorist. God loved that terrorist. And he wanted him to come to, to the Lord. And so he found three men, three new covenant, Old Testament seed form, three new covenant Christians. Hebrews 11.34 says, By faith they quenched the power of fire. These men lived by faith. They were trusting God. Now there is a surrender that looks like full surrender. 1 Corinthians 13, If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, 
Doesn't that sound like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? But do not have love, it profits me nothing. There's a surrender. You give everything you have and your body to be burned. And it profits nothing. Because it's all flesh. It's all done by works. And it's not by the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. So there's a way to yield up your body to be burned, and it means nothing. Uh, they had faith before they ever got into the furnace. Daniel 3.18 Even if he does not deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, we're not going to serve your gods, worship your golden image that you have set up. Long before the furnace, these men had faith. Talk about standing up against peer pressure. The whole world bowed down and they stood up against peer pressure. Talk about not being mesmerized by the music of this world. They stood out. Talk about not being afraid in the face of this violent death. These men were men of faith. And though they were men of faith, standing against peer pressure, not listening to the music of this world, not being afraid, to take a stand on righteousness. Nebuchadnezzar didn't see Christ. You see that? They had faith before, but Nebuchadnezzar and all sinners, before the furnace, they just think you're stupid. They think you're dumb. They think you've lost your mind. Why are you living like that? They do not respect your faith before the furnace. They mock you. They laugh at you. They call you names before the furnace. And after the furnace, they still had faith. These men were trusting the Lord before the furnace, in the furnace, after the furnace. After the furnace, when it's all over, now they'll respect your faith. Before, they mock your faith. After, they respect your faith. But the point is that it's when you're in the furnace. It was in the furnace that Nebuchadnezzar was moved. Every furnace God ever calls you to get in has a peephole in it. And there's some Nebuchadnezzar looking. There's some Nebuchadnezzar looking in, watching what you're going through, watching what I'm going through. It's always for others. And no matter how hot it gets, when that heat is turned up, that's when they're watching you the most. That is their opportunity and God's opportunity. And God calls attention to these things in his attempt to win Nebuchadnezzar to himself. Nebuchadnezzar was gazing into the furnace. These guys were in the furnace, but Nebuchadnezzar was looking in, and it became redemptive. Daniel chapter 3.20, he, command, uh, he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the furnace. Let me just turn this table. One thing that got his attention was that these guys are no longer bound. They were tied up. They, were, they had cords on them. They were bound. Daniel 3.24 Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded. He stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Were not three men cast bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, Certainly, O king. And in verse 25, I see four men loosed and walking around in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. They were free. They had liberty. They were not bound by the world. And that blew his mind. And that's what they're watching for. That's what they're going to see. Now, I'm sure when he looked into the furnace, 
I'm I'm sure he expected to see ashes. <laughs> he expected to see them incinerated. And if they were alive, I'm sure he would have expected to see them screaming and writhing in pain and trying to get out or something like that. But they're at peace. They're walking around and <laughs> with the fourth person. This is an amazing story. Uh, the thing that won his heart, of course, the manifestation of Christ. Uh, verse 25 again, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. The sinners look into the fire and they see your liberty, but mostly they see you walking with the fourth man. I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell us that Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach and Meshach even knew he was there. He never said anything to them. I'm not sure, because they walked with him before the furnace. They walked with him after the furnace. They might have just been walking with him. But the sinners saw it. Those who are looking, they see it. I have to smile when I say suffering because if you read the record, these guys didn't suffer at all. Uh, the, the point is that they were experiencing the last part, 2 Corinthians 4, the outer man perishes, the inner man is renewed day by day, and behind the scenes, we dealt with that a little bit last time, that while you are going through redemptive suffering, behind the scenes you're knowing Jesus. And when you compare, you're entering into an intimate relationship with your God. It's not worthy to be compared. It doesn't. You don't compare it. It's not worthy to be compared to what you are experiencing behind the scene. Second Corinthians four sixteen. We do not lose heart, though our outer man is decaying, our inner man's being renewed day by day for momentary light affliction. Whatever it is, is momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. We need God to renew our minds to see things as he sees them. Daniel 3.22, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered round and saw in regard to these men, the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon him. That's what happens behind the scenes. Sometimes I hear testimonies, and honestly, I just want to cringe. Uh, when we look at chapter 11, you'll see where Paul said, I wish I never gave this testimony. I speak as a fool. I'm insane. This is not how God would do it. Because it had the smell of smoke all over it. If you give a testimony, and it ends up that people say, Oh, poor Ed Miller, look what he's going through. <laughs> you haven't given the right test. That's the smell of fire, the smell of smoke all over that testimony. The only legitimate testimony is Christ has come and Christ has rescued and Christ has given peace and all that kind of thing. Now, otherwise, you think that the suffering's for you. It's not for you. It's for somebody else. Uh, I know that I've been through time before God dawned a little bit of this on me. I've been through times that and gone through some suffering and my heart attitude was I wish I wish this suffering were over so that I could get back to the business of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I wish this would be finished because it's a distraction to missions. It's a distraction to soul winning. I want to get back to the main thing. The suffering is the main thing. It's not a distraction. You know, get out of it in order to get back to soul winning. That is how God manifests his life. The furnace is the main thing. Let me give the New Testament illustration. I didn't realize the illustrations would take this long because I had other stuff. But anyway, let me give the New Testament illustration. This is bud form. So it's still stories. It's not quite 
the doctrine which comes in the epistles. Uh, it's from John chapter 4. Remember the woman at the well. I think you're all familiar with that, or if not, I'll make you familiar. John 4, 6. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. <clears throat> Many commentaries, when they see Jesus being wearied from his journey, use that to prove the humanity of Christ. And there's no question that proves the humanity of Christ. But I don't think the main point is to prove Jesus was true man. I think the main point is something like this, that when Jesus lived in his incarnate body, sometime he allowed that body to get weary. And Jesus sat down because he was tired. He was exhausted. And he sat down on that well. Now Jesus lived in that body for 33 and a half years on the earth. And he allowed that body to become weary. He was weary because it was a long journey. So he sat down by the well. And as he sat there, weary, a thirsty sinner came by. Don't just read that la la la. This is so instructive. Uh, a thirsty sinner came by and the conversation turned redemptive. And not only did she come to the Lord, but look at chapter 4, verse 41. Many more believed because of his word. <clears throat> and they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. We've heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Because he allowed his body to get weary, a thirsty sinner comes by, she comes to the Lord, and the whole city comes to the Lord. And may I suggest, it's the same Jesus, and he has a new body now. Do not be surprised if Jesus in his new body allows his body to become weary. We are now his body. And sometime we become weary and we're exhausted and we just sit down in order to catch our breath and, and, and become alive again. And it's amazing how God will engineer at that time in your weakness, when you're down, when your body's weary. It's amazing how some thirsty person will come into your life and God will use that redemptively. And you'll be able to share. You're not trying to share. The last thing in the world, those three Hebrews were saying is, Oh, God loves Nebuchadnezzar, and he wants to save Nebuchadnezzar, and we got to be a good testimony, and so let's grin it and bear it. And there was none of that. They weren't trying to be missionaries. They weren't trying to win souls. They were just knowing Jesus. And that's what he's called you to do. That's what he's called me to do. Just to know him, and he will live and arrange redemptive experiences so that in your weariness, in your weakness, that's why Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. And it's because of redemptive suffering that his life can be poured out. So in our weakness, in our exhaustion, uh, in our uh, nothingness, that's when he uses us the most. Uh, let me start. That brings us, believe it or not, to our new material. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was important to stress again the purpose of redemptive suffering. But now, <laughs> turn please to the second list of suffering, and that's in chapter 6. We looked at the list. There are three lists. One in chapter 4, one in chapter 6, and one in chapter 11. And now we're in chapter 6, uh, begin at verse 3, giving no cause for offense in anything, so that the ministry will not be discredited. 
in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers yet true, unknown yet well known, dying yet behold we live, punished yet not put to death, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. I pointed out in our last session uh, that this list has to do, we're talking now emphasis, focus, with ministry. Notice in verse 3, giving no cause for offense in anything, so that the ministry be not discredited. And in verse 4, in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God. And then it goes into the list. The point is, in chapter 4, the emphasis is Jesus living. The emphasis in chapter 6 is Jesus manifest. Jesus being seen. Now we have the ministry. What is the ministry? The ministry is the manifestation of the life of Christ. That's what ministry is. And so the list in four takes, here's Jesus living so that he can shine. Now chapter 6, he's going to shine. And we're going to look at the ministry. <clears throat> now, it's easy to say in redemptive suffering, people see Jesus. But what do they see, really, when they see Jesus? You know they can't see Jesus. He's in your heart. He's in heaven. So what are they seeing? that is called the manifestation of Christ. And I believe that's what these verses in chapter 6 are talking about. And so what I'd like to show you is when non-Christians or weak believers look at you going through redemptive suffering and we say, now they see the Lord. What are they seeing that translates into the Lord? You know, we say, we see Jesus as shepherd. That doesn't mean that now we're going to become shepherds. We'll be like him. No, we see him as shepherd, and we lay down in green pastures, and we're led in paths of righteousness, and we're by the still waters. That's what they're seeing. And they look and say, wow, he must have a wonderful shepherd. And so the experience translates into the revelation of Christ. But what are they seeing? Let's take the Corinthian look uh, at what they're seeing, since they're not going to see a physical Jesus. <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 4, we'll begin there. In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance. And then it goes into the list. In much endurance. Endurance in what? Follow the list. Afflictions, endurance and hardship, endurance and distresses, endurance and beating, endurance and imprisonment, endurance and tumults, endurance and labors, endurance and sleeplessness, endurance and hungers. What are they seeing? They're seeing you endure. That's the principle. They see the Christian enduring. Now, when the life of Christ is manifest, and one of the biggest things they see is endurance. Now, since we're speaking of the New Covenant Christian, I want to save time and just explain in a, in a sentence or two, a couple of verses, what we're talking about. You know, sometimes we, uh, I get a lot of emails that somebody say, pray for me, I need patience. 
And I almost have to la laugh because I remember when I used to pray for patience and all that kind of thing. And because we don't have a clue, the patience that we need. We just don't have a clue. And what they think is, uh, well, pray for me. I've got almost enough. I need another jug of patience, and then I'll get through the week all right. <clears throat> for many, it's, it's, you know, I'm ready to give up. I'm, I'm losing my temper. I'm ready to retaliate, and I, I need to hold it in. I need to suppress my anxiety. I need patience. Help me pray. I need patience because I can't grin it and bear it. I can't hang in there. And as Lillian told me at the beginning of the year, trust the Lord and suck it up. Remember that? <laughs> It gets to a time you just can't suck it up anymore. All right. There are two verses on endurance, the kind we're talking about, that give you an illustration that we're on another level. We're, we are spiritual people, and we're talking spiritually. Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Now, you know who his is. That's God. <laughs> All power according to his glorious might. You think that's a lot of power? Why do you need that much power? For the attaining of steadfastness and patience. Isn't that amazing? I need all the power that God has to be patient. And that's why I laugh when I say, hey, pray that I have patience. You need the life of God. Thy life for mine in this. I need his life to be patient. It's not something that I do. And don't read this la la la. Uh, all power according to his glorious might. You can't have a greater measure than that. And God says, for every drop of patience that you need, you need all the power of God, His glorious power, all of His might. The other verse, it's very similar. It's chapter 5 of Galatians, verse 22. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, there's not nine fruits of the Spirit. There's a fruit. Love. That's the fruit. One fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And these are, read 1 Corinthians 13, you'll see these are expressions of love. There's only the one fruit, love. But, now watch, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. It's from the Spirit. Patience is not a work. It is a gift. And it's a gift from the Spirit of God. Uh, it's wrong, let me just sort of summarize it. It's wrong to think. And, and I know we've heard it so many times. I need to live by faith, and I need the grace of God. I need His patience. Why? To get through what I'm going through. You see, that makes it about you. You think you're going through something, and you need to survive. And so you need God's grace in order to get you through it, in order to give you the strength to get through it. And the reality is, it's not about me. I need to live by grace. And I need to live by faith. But why? Why do I need grace? Why do I need faith? And I'll tell you why. Because Jesus lives in me. And he has declared that he is going to live a radical life. He is going to live in me a redemptive life. He's going to choose experiences for me I would never choose for myself. He's going to allow me to go through stuff that I would never choose. And I need grace to let him have his way. I need grace and faith to trust that he knows what's best and what he brings into my life. He is the one that's living. And I'm carrying the dying of Jesus. And I need grace not to survive... Because I'm surviving behind the scenes. I'm knowing Jesus. My inner man's being renewed. Survival's not the issue. I need to trust God because, quite honestly, he's radical. He does some crazy things. I speak as a fool. But what he is going to do in my life and where he's going to take me, and, I've, and I am giving him permission to go anywhere he wants to go in my life. 
And I'm giving him permission to allow anything he wants to allow in my life. Because he loves sinners. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We are expendable for the wicked. And he is willing to lay down our lives to win them. And so I've got to say, yes, I need grace for that. I need faith to trust him that he's going to live in me in the way that he thinks best. And if he wants to take me to a nursing home or uh, to uh, lose my mind in Alzheimer's or whatever, that's redemptive. And I've got to say, I'm going to trust you, Lord. You brought this into my life, and it's for others. I may not see it. Maybe I will. It's for others, and I trust you for that. So, that's the first thing they're going to see, is your supernatural endurance. You're going to be enduring all of these things by the power of God, according to His glorious might. And when they see your endurance, because they don't have it, they don't have it, they're ready to throw in the towel. They're going to give up. They're going to crash. And they look at the Christian, and he keeps keeping up and behind the scenes and he has joy and he has peace and they don't understand that and they see Christ that's the first thing they see now let me show you the second thing <clears throat> second Corinthians 6 4 in everything commending ourselves as servants of God much afflictions hardships distresses beatings imprisonments tumults labors sleeplessness hungers the first part of verse 4, the basic circumstances of life, afflictions, hardships, and distresses. God breaks this up into circumstances. I'm going to suffer in my circumstances. And then in verse 5, in beatings, imprisonments, tumults, I'm going to suffer from what sinful people do to me. Persecution. And then in the last part of five, in tumults, labor, sleeplessness, hunger. These are the trials that are just connected with the Christian life and ministry. Whether it's your circumstances, whether it's what other people are doing to you, whether it's just the everyday trials of your ministry, they're going to watch you endure. What else do they see when they look at you? Oh, I'm way over. Uh, should we? If you have to, leave. all right. Let me. What else do they see? All right. That's because we're used to hearing it after twelve o'clock on Sundays. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, I'll rush these next two points and then develop them a little more. Next time. Okay. The second thing they see is your holy life. They not only see you enduring, but verse 6 and 7, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by weapons of righteousness, the right hand and the left they see that even though you're going through stuff, you don't compromise. You do the right thing. You stand on the Word of God no matter what they say or, or how they mock you. And they're watching you. And they're amazed that you have the fortitude to stand and do what is right. And they will strike you, and you will not retaliate. You'll not fight back. You'll turn the other cheek. You'll give your cloak. You'll go the second mile. That is a mighty miracle of God. And when they see you enduring, and they see you doing the right thing, and living a holy life, and not backing off, and not compromising, I'm suggesting they see Jesus. And then there's one other thing they see. They not only see your endurance, your holy life, but notice in verse 7, the word of truth, the power of God, 
weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers, yet true, unknown, yet well known, dying, yet behold we live, punished, yet not put to death, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, making many rich, having nothing, possessing all things. When they look at you, they see your endurance. When they look at you, they see your holy life. And when they look at you, they see an amazing paradox. That's the opposite. They see this, this irony that you go through the same bereavement they go through. They see the tears coming down your cheek when you put a loved one in the grave. But they also hear your heart and your song, and, and they know that it's all right, and you're at peace. They're not. They can't do it. They can't go through it. They're going crazy. They need to get medicine. They need to, to, to have some kind of a uh, something to cure their anxiety, frustration. But you, how do you have that peace? How do you have that rest? Why aren't you bothered by this? How can you keep looking to the Lord? Don't you think he's forgotten you? And, you're try and they see the paradox. They see what's happening in their life. And they look at you. And they see you as poor and weak. And you're a nobody. Nobody knows you. But suddenly everybody knows you. You're unknown. They have well known. You have nothing. Gold and silver, you have none. And yet you're the ones that are making people rich. Because you have everything. You have nothing. You have everything. Because you have it all in Christ. You have Christ in all and all in Christ. When they see your endurance, when they see your holy life, and when they see this paradox, they see Jesus. Well, we'll stop there. May God help us with this understanding redemptive suffering. Comments or questions? The farm refers to, to realize how hot it was. He bumped it up seven times. Seven is as hot as that furnace will go. How hot was that? It was so hot that, this, that well, at least six soldiers that carried them in, they died carrying them in. Yeah. You know how you stick your hand in the oven and get it out real fast? They got in but couldn't get out. Yeah. And, and you were talking about numbers, uh, the four scenarios in Second Corinthians 4, 8. Well, Second Corinthians 4 times 2 is 8. <laughs> Speaking of that, go back to that furnace. Uh, seven times hotter. It's also seven times brighter. And they saw the fourth man. How bright is he? How bright is he? Let's vote on it. Was that Jesus, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> Indeed. So about Jesus, it is. The body is different. Jesus is something else because he was in an adult body then before he was even born. Well, he was <laughs> yeah, well, he appeared many God. times. <laughs> All right, let's. let's uh, Lou, do we have a song today? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Before he sings, Nita, the one that serves us. Oh, yes. She's here. She told me that she is now three weeks without smoking. Yes. Oh, oh, without oh, 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 oh that is yeah. wonderful. She's on chin, chin yeah. 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 And She said she's had that temptation, but she, I told her we would pray. Amen. Yeah, thank you. She uh, she uh, mentioned that to me, and I reminded her her power for that is the Lord. So, all right, let's pray, and uh, we'll remember Nita. Our Father, thank you for your presence with us, and thank you for the revelation of the Lord Jesus in your Word. We thank you for your hand in Nita's life and how you have restored her, and as she went through so much, and we just pray that she would know what it is to claim your life as her power over this addiction. And we know that you'll do that and you're doing it now. And we pray that we all, everyone, Nita and all of us here, even those listening by tape, 
that we all might go forward 